extended to me to be part of this uh, program, to be part of the blessing that God is extending to his children uh, this week in the area of uh, family life. I just want to thank everybody who's uh, organizing and uh, uh, planning and um, to make sure that uh, we have this uh, blessing. And maybe if you would allow, I could mention by name, Sister Rhoda Williams, uh, who was instrumental in creating the uh, preliminary context to make sure that uh, this uh, is um, uh, happening. And I want to thank the Lord for all the speakers who have gone on before. Among them, uh, Elder Mashudu Ravengani, uh, one of my close friends and a man that I greatly respect uh, with regards to his teaching of God's word and particularly in the area of family life that he's so passionate about and that he has dedicated his life uh, to. So we just want to thank the Lord. And let me begin by saying that uh, one of my favorite expressions in the area of family life is an expression that was made by the celebrated uh, Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy. Uh, writing in one of his novels, he begins that novel by saying that uh, all happy families are alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. All happy families are alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Uh, what that simply means is there is no way a family will just be happy and everything is flowing smoothly, everything is functional. It takes a lot of intentionality, a lot of effort and time to make it happen. No one just wakes up in the morning with an amazing garden, whether a vegetable garden or a flower garden, whatever kind of garden or field. It doesn't happen that way, at least not in my country here. If ever uh, you see a garden or a field that is doing so well, the crops are thriving and there are no weeds inside, that already tells you that a lot of planning, a lot of effort, a lot of time went into making that a reality. In the same way in the area of family life, amazing families don't just happen. Even among Christians, uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of prayer, a lot of effort, a lot of learning. And let's imagine, let's just think of it like, like this. You know, unfortunately, many times uh, in many parts of the world, including right here in my country, many people just assume that, you know, amazing family life, I mean, family life just happens. You know, you can just have an, a, a, an amazing family life without taking any time and effort in preparing and doing all that is necessary for that. For example, I see among young people many times that they put an inordinately huge amount of time and even resources in terms of money into planning for a wedding, a wedding that lasts like uh, for some hours, at most a day. And so nobody's saying that uh, people should have lousy weddings, but we're also saying that it's tragic if people can prepare so much for a wedding, but forget to prepare for the marriage. Uh, the life that you live in, I mean, after the wedding day, you know. So it is important to take time to prepare. That's why I want to appreciate the organizers of this program. That may the Lord truly bless every one of you uh, with uh, the preparations that have gone into this and all the families that are represented in this program. May the Lord truly extend his blessing and whatever time and resources that have been invested, may they uh, reap rich dividends for every one of us in our different families. And so I want to begin by sharing my screen because that's where my talking points will be uh, right there. So as we begin to do that, or as we uh, do that, let me, okay, that's all right. So today we're talking about uh, seasoned speech, seasoned speech. That's what uh, we are focusing on, or that's what I'm talking about uh, as uh, we see in the, in the program, uh, seasoned speech. So, you know, the key text is Colossians chapter four, verse number six. 
uh, Colossians 4 verse 6, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Let your speech, not some of the times, be gracious, not most of the times be gracious, but uh, the Bible says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Now, so this really comes from the domain of food, the metaphor or the figure of speech that Paul is impl employing comes from the domain of food or from the from kitchen land, uh, if you like. Now, one of the things with uh, food is, of course, uh, this thing of, uh, I mean, after the uh, food has been cooked or prepared, it needs to be uh, presented. You know, this is something that I learned uh, a little bit later in my life because where I grew up, it was not something that was uh, ever talked about. But uh, this is something that my wife is quite particular about, you know, food presentation. Okay, the food has been prepared. It is nutritious. It is healthy. And uh, we are hungry. We have the appetite. We are ready to devour the food. But there is something that is called food presentation. And so those times when I've taken, um, you know, uh, been the one maybe cooking and uh, serving food to the family, sometimes my wife says, no, I mean, how, how are we going to eat this food? I mean, the tomatoes are cut one way and uh, the cucumbers are cut in another way. These things are supposed to be uniform so that they are appealing to the eye. And, you know, that is the idea of food presentation. Uh, it is an, an important concept because it, it, it the food has to appeal to the eye. It has to be good looking, not only good tasting. And that is an important concept. Maybe some of you people uh, did culinary arts and things like that, and you could articulate this in a much better way without struggling the way this uh, pasta is. And so uh, this is so important, but no matter how nutritious, no matter how good looking food might be, if it is not seasoned, if it doesn't have salt, if it is that kind of food that needs salt um, for it to taste good, it will be, you know, insipid. It will be tasteless in our mouths. And no one, I mean, hardly would anyone enjoy a meal like that. Unless maybe somebody is on a, some program that is requiring them to eat uh, food that doesn't have salt. But otherwise, ordinarily speaking, salt aids flavor and taste to our food so that we can taste the food. It's palatable. We can enjoy it in the same way with that understanding. Paul then says, when you serve your words, when you are serving, when you're dishing out your words, uh, when words are coming out of your mouth, when you are speaking, when as you interact, as you communicate, as you, uh, you know, uh, in the context of family for today, uh, but although Paul, when he was writing, he was speaking in the context of church and also the general community. But for today, we are primarily confining ourselves to the family and then secondarily, we can go broader. And so when we serve, our food should be present, I mean, our words should be presentable, should be acceptable, should be uh, appealing, and even when we're disagreeing, somebody, uh, some people have said, even in disagreeing, do not disagree in a disagreeable manner. Uh, one can disagree in a respectful and dignified manner. And so it is important. Words need seasoning so that they have flavor. They, there is taste to them. And our speech, the way we speak, the way we interact, the way we share with family members, how do we speak in our families? Uh, did you know that an estimated, an estimated 80% of all communication that takes place in families is negative? It is negative communication. And in some instances, it is not just negative, but actually toxic. It is toxic. And so when you talk of negative communication, that means it's complaints, it's um, uh, things like that, uh, that are not positive, that are just negative. It's not 
are nourishing. It doesn't build up. It's um, criticizing and, you know, finding fault, pointing out, why didn't you just do this? How come you didn't call me? How come you never asked me? And so on and so on. Many times when people are interacting in families, much of the communication uh, is, is estimated at 80% negative. And so in many instances, it is actually toxic. That means things that are being said, whether to a spouse or even to children, things that are said to children, you know, the words that are spoken in, 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 many, in many uh, instances in families. Those are words that are toxic. They don't make our um, family members healthier, better in terms of their mental health, in terms of their, they're not edifying spiritually, but they are words that may actually pull and tear them down, pull and tear them down. And so these are words, uh, but it is so common in many families. And that means those words are not seasoned or these, these are forms of speech that are not seasoned with salt. They are not seasoned with uh, kindness. And so we find in Proverbs chapter 21, verse number nine, for instance, uh, where the Bible says, it is better to live in the corner of a small, in a small corner uh, at, the, at the rooftop than to share the house with a woman who's always arguing. In other words, a contentious uh, woman now, this could apply to a contentious father. This could apply to a contentious mother, a contentious uh, father or parent. This could apply to a contentious uh, child. So whatever the case, so uh, what this Bible text is uh, uh, pointing out to us is that negative, constant negative communication or persistent negative communication in the context of family it drives out family members people don't want to be in that space and so if they are coming from work they don't they pray they don't get home even though they are going home they pray they don't get home or if they get home everybody should be asleep i mean to spare themselves from all the toxicity that could be there all the negativity that could be there you know this verse is repeated three times in the book of proverbs the third time, it is slightly varied. And it says that it's actually better to live out in the wild, in the wilderness with wild animals, than to live in the same space, in the same house, as toxic and negative family members. All they're always talking about is negative. It's complaints, it's criticism, it's belittling, cutting words, second guessing what others are. Uh, you know, second guessing others, and so on. And so when this happens, it's, it kills uh, that, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the spirit or the atmosphere of togetherness in the context of the family. So it is better to live in the corner, uh, in a small corner uh, of, of the rooftop than to live in the same space with somebody that is always negative another text says that um, like constant dripping on a rainy day is a person who's always say i mean churning out negativity always churning out negativity so like constant dripping you know the roof when the roof is leaking on a on a rainy day you know sometimes uh like if it's a tropical cyclone or something like that and uh, it's raining for many days and there's this constant dripping. It's so irritating. It gets under your skin. It's annoying. And I mean, it's difficult. And the Bible says that is what constant negativity, you know, uh, continuous negative speech and talk. That's what it is like uh, to your spouse, to your children, to your family members, whoever they might be. And so, uh, the Bible is pointing out the issue of negative communication. The Bible also says in Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life are in the power of
bring a relationship, a family uh, together or can destroy a family that once uh, had, you know, that once shared close um, in intimacy. You can destroy and ruin intimacy. The way we speak, uh, the way we interact or how we share our words. So, um, so death and life are in the power of the tongue. What it simply means is be careful with your tongue. Be careful with your speech. The words that you say, the words that you speak. Sometimes people talk so much about, uh, like, for example, um, physical abuse in the context of the family. And sometimes we overlook the power that is there in the tongue, the emotional scars that can be caused. And the internal bleeding, the, inter, the psychological bleeding, the scars that can be left um, after certain cutting words, careless words have been spoken and they've been given. So it is important. We need to be careful with our tongue. A story is told that in one African village, a father wanted to teach his children the value of words. And so, he told them after they uh, killed a chicken, um, and so he said to them, may you take all the uh, the feathers, all the feathers, you know how it is like in a village setting, wherever you may come from. But I'm imagining an African village, and it's not difficult for me to do that because I'm in Africa. And so, um, but I hope you can relate no matter where you may come from. And so they took all these uh, the feathers, and then they put into a small basket. And the father said to his sons, now may you go through the village and uh, may you be, uh, you know, taking these feathers and you throw them out uh, until you get to the end of the village. Right at the end, that's where you're supposed to uh, throw out the last of the feathers. And so they, the sons did exactly that. And after some time, they came back and reported back to dad and said, Dad, we have done what you said. And so the, the father said, okay, uh, may I see the basket? And so they showed him the basket, said, here it is. Said, okay, I see there are no feathers anymore. Now, may you go back? Do you still remember the way you went? They said, sure we do. And he said, may you go back and pick up all those feathers and bring them right back here. So the sons went uh, through the village after a long time, they came back, but they had less than a quarter, or maybe we might say just an eighth of um, the initial amount of feathers. And the father looked at them and said, where are the rest? They said, we could not retrieve them. The father said, that is the point. Words are like these feathers. The moment they've gone out, you can't take them back in. The moment they've gone out, you cannot retrieve them. At least you could get a few of the feathers. But with words, once they've gone out, you can never call them back. And in, uh, with this in mind, we need to know that there is a power in the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Life, I mean, the tongue can bring death to a thriving marriage, to a, um, a loving relationship, can be destroyed through speech, but even a dying marriage or relationship can be resuscitated and brought back to life. It can be re-energized, reinvigorated, rejuvenated through words also. And that's why our speech should be seasoned so that we know how we ought to speak in any situation, in any given context, at any time. So there is a power in our words and we need to weigh them carefully before we speak. Somebody put it this way, that always make sure you have engaged your brain before you put your mouth into gear. Your brain is engaged before you put your mouth into gear. And those who are careful with their speech, they will eat its fruit. In other words, they will, uh, they will the, the, the families will benefit, relationships will benefit when we are careful with our speech. And, uh, you know, communication, we're not talking about listening today, we're just talking about talking, you know, but communication would 
involve speaking and listening, of course, nonverbal communication also. But for today, we're just talking about talking, okay? That's all we're talking about. Words that come out of our mouths. And the Bible says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. But if you are careful, you will, re you will reap rich dividends or it will greatly benefit your relationships, your family, your children. Everybody in the family will be greatly benefited uh, by good uh, speaking uh, skills. And so let's talk about the seasoning. We cannot be exhaustive, but I just want to point out a few of the elements, five of the things that uh, could be done that can be done to season our speech. Because the opening text that we read, uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse number 6, told us that uh, let your speech always be gracious and seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer, how you ought to speak to your spouse, how you ought to speak to your children, how you ought to speak to your parents, to in-laws, how we ought to speak as a family. Let our speech be seasoned. This is God's expectation. This is what God uh, says to us. And so uh, the first thing is be positive. Be positive. In other words, uh, we talked about uh, the negativity and the toxicity that is often found in family communications and interactions. And so the first thing, aim to be positive. Just be positive. What we mean by that. Uh, what, what, we, what we mean by that is uh, that many times, many people within their families only speak or speak out when something is wrong. If everything is okay, they won't say anything. They won't say nothing. If the food has been well uh, prepared and the salt is just okay, everything is just good, they have no comment. But the day there's too much, a bit too much salt in the food, or when the food, I mean, smells like it was burning, that's when they will speak. And they say, I mean, is this a burnt offering? What is this? We're always eating burnt offerings in this house and things like that, even though it's not really always, but they can even exaggerate for the purposes of whatever, expressing that negativity. What you are saying, brothers and sisters, is that let's be positive. Let's uh, not only speak when something negative has happened. In fact, some uh, family therapists and um, uh, family life experts tell us that for every negative thing that you may say to your spouse, uh, to your children, you should have at least three positive things to counter it. At least three positive things that you also say. Now, if all that you say in all your interactions with your family members during the course of the day are negative things. It's constant negativity, constant toxicity, nothing positive, no compliments, no words of appreciation, no words of affirmation, no words of, uh, you know, oh man, it, it, it's draining emotionally. It drains that person. If it's a child, they will eventually see themselves as worthless, as useless, they cannot amount to anything. They become, begin to have low self-esteem. It might even be your spouse. If you're always complaining, the day that he or she is dressed nicely, you don't say no nothing. But the day you disapprove, uh, they put on a suit or dress that you disapprove of, that's when you say all these words and you wax lyrical, saying all these kind of things. It is draining. When you say positive things, it's like you are depositing into their emotional bank account. And every time we say negative things to our family members, we are actually withdrawing from that bank account. And so if we never have deposits, but we are constantly withdrawing, we will get to a point where that account will get overdrawn and it cannot be sustainable anymore. And so there are people within their families, they are running with emotional bank accounts that are well overdrawn, you know? And so, because there's no positive things that are said, and the Bible says, let your speech be seasoned. And part of that seasoning of our speech is to be deliberately positive. Try to catch your children doing something positive. Try to catch your son, your daughter, or whoever in, in the family doing something positive and you parade them before the family and say, today I'm so proud. 
I'm a proud dad. I'm a proud mother. Because John watered the garden without me having uh, to tell him so, or washed the car, or did this and that. He uh, made his room. Nobody reminded him. I'm so proud. And you're announcing to the whole family. How do you think your child is going to feel? They will want to do even more. They will want to do even better. So it is uh, in affirming them where they've done good and so on. We're not saying that we should not correct when our children or maybe point out or express when we're not happy or we disapprove of something within our family members. But we're saying, what I'm saying is, we need to be deliberate, to be positive. That positivity cannot just happen. Um, you know, because of our fallen nature, it's easy to see the negative more than the positive. Of course, you might have heard that story, that hypothetical story of a university professor uh, at a university like Cambridge. Other exam materials, you also gave a white sheet of paper okay, a white sheet of paper that had a small dot um, near the top left corner of the A4 size paper. It was a white sheet of paper with this tiny dot. And so the question was, uh, write what you can see on the paper. And so people wrote, some made calculations, the circumference of that dot and whatever and so on is angle in relation to these corners and they, they calculated things man they calculated things and so on and so on people wrote pages calculating and you know expressing whatever it is and so on and so on but nobody saw the white surface nobody saw the white surface everybody saw that tiny uh, dot but the large white surface the clear surface nobody talked about it as if it was not there. The question was, may you write what you see on the paper? And nobody saw that. That is like many of us. Sometimes there's this dot in a spouse's life, in a child's life, and that's all we are fixated on. That's all we talk about and so on. And we overlook, we don't even see. Sometimes we don't even wish to see all the positive things that that person does. Oh man, even, uh, even, a clock that doesn't work is correct twice a day. It is at least correct two times a day. A clock that is dead, that, that is not functional, it's correct at least twice a day. Even those people who may do things that we disapprove of, they have things that they also do and do good. Why can't we focus on that? And because that is a positive way of building them telling them that uh, we, we love them, we are confident of them, we appreciate them. And that makes even the negative things we may point out more acceptable, palatable. That is the seasoning that we are doing. What you say is as important as how you say it. Certain things are rejected, not because they are wrong, but how they are said, how they are stated. Some challenges are never resolved in our families because of how we say our things. And so, uh, number two, let's use pleasant tone of voice. Pleasant tone of voice. Did you know that uh, many of us as human beings, we do not struggle having, uh, using a pleasant tone of voice when we're talking to strangers at work, at church, wherever, in the community, in, in the marketplace, in the mall, and so on. We, I mean, we, we're so, hello, hi, how are you? Oh, hey, how are you? Oh, long time, where have you been? I haven't seen you in ages. And so on, I mean, positive tone, tone of voice. But um, many, many times, many people reserve the worst tone of voice for their family members. The people, um, they should care about the most and the people who definitely care about them the most. Those are the ones that get the worst tone of voice and may God help us. It doesn't help. The, I mean, tone of voice co communicates much. It says more than the words. 
actually in a context of communication, words constitute just about 7% of meaning. And over 30% of meaning is conveyed by the tone of voice. The tone of voice, that is where sometimes the words themselves that we may say at, uh, at times may sound innocent or may look innocent if they were to be printed on paper. But if someone were to hear an audio of how the words were said, you realize that there was a venom in the tone. There was sarcasm. There was whatever it is. There is something that was toxic in the tone, in the tone. So what kind of tone of voice do you use with your family members? Is it a pleasant tone of voice? What kind of volume? And with uh, at what speed do you speak? I mean, what tone of voice? What are the qualities or characteristics of your voice when you are talking, not to strangers? Many of us use, I mean, we're okay with the rest of the people out there. It is with our family members that sometimes we use the worst tone of voice. And so let's season our speech using the best tone of voice and then make use of uh, you. I mean, we should understand the difference between you and I messages. As we speak, uh, you know, um, you may object to something. Maybe you disapprove of something that's happening that your children maybe are doing uh, and so on and or your spouse is doing. You know, there are two different ways, broad ways in which we can speak. Number one, someone can use you messages and say, you are always doing this to me. Why, do, why is it that you don't understand? You, I know why you're doing this. You want me to get fired in my, uh, from my job. I know and that kind of you, you, you. I mean, it's always you. Yeah, and it's pointing at the other person. You are the problem. You are the, you know, in other words, um, if you were not here, my life would be much better. Or my life minus you is uh, equals happiness or peace. Now, the you statements, what they do, they name, they shame, okay? They name and shame the other person. And in the process, that closes lines of communication because the other person instinctively becomes self-defensive or, or becomes defensive, okay? And because nobody wants to be vulnerable to physical or even verbal attacks. The inst inst uh, instinct in us is to self-preserve and that blocks lines of communication. You cannot understand each other. A better way to communicate is to use I messages. I feel offended when these kind of words are said to me, especially in the presence of the children. I feel belittled when this is said about me in public. I feel, I mean, you are talking about yourself, how you feel about a specific uh, behavior or conduct of somebody, you know? And this, it doesn't attack, it doesn't shame the other person. And because of that, it opens lines of communication and actually helps uh, you to focus, the, the people involved, to focus on the challenge that is uh, pointed out. But many times we don't even realize which mode of speech we are using, whether it's you or I, and almost a default setting for us, affected by seen as we are, is to use the you message formula. So you may actually begin out with a valid point of something that you wanted to point out. But the moment it's uh, conveyed using the you message formula, it actually changes even what you are saying. And it becomes another story. And at the end of the day, it gets so complicated, it gets acrimonious, it gets ugly, and things degenerate. And you wonder what happened. Um, let our speech be seasoned with the use of I message formula. And then uh, let's also pick the best time, even the most pleasant of food. If it's served at midnight, and I mean, people may be sleepy, or if it's too early in the morning, it may be the best food in town, but the timing may be off. So even for sensitive communication, we also need to find the right timing, but this is more appropriate, particularly if we are talking about conflict resolution. Um, so let me hurry and talk about the fifth one, and that is take time to talk. We actually need time to talk. I know that, for example, in places like the UK, I've never been in England, um, but I understand maybe relating with the other uh, like first world countries that I've visited, 
um, that it's so hectic, it's so busy, the schedules are tight, and so on. And one of the things that can easily suffer is lack of time to talk, lack of time to talk, you know, to bond as family. Let's create time to talk. You know, it can be pillow talk, it can be uh, we uh, exercise and talk in the morning or in the evening, whatever is most suitable for us as people are driving to work, whatever it is, that time needs to be created. It's actually needed. Time to talk. Talking brings can bring people together. And not talking can separate people once we're close. And so, uh, brothers and sisters, let's end it at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4 through 9. I'm going to read this uh, from my Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. So we are talking about seasoned speech. Let's our, let our speech be seasoned. Let it be seasoned. Good speech doesn't just happen. It is something that has to be intentional. We need to put in the effort, especially when it relates to family members. So the Bible says from verse number 4 uh, of Deuteronomy chapter 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on, on your forehead. Write them on the door frames of uh, your do houses and on your gates and so on. So God says, you know, the Lord taught the Israelites many things. And God says, this should not just be stuff for adults. This has to be filtered down to the children according to their levels of understanding. I think that sometimes uh, we wait until it is too late. We wait until there are complications. And so what I'm simply saying is that these things that I've talked about uh, tonight, even what we're learning this week, let's, let, let's find a way to filter this down to our children. And the Bible says, use all teachable moments when you sit down, as you get up, when you're traveling, whether you're flying, you're on the road, you're in the subway, you're on the train, whatever. Use whatever teachable moments you can find so that these things are impressed on their minds. It's not something that is done uh, without effort or intentionality. It's something that takes effort and focus and consistence and persistence so that it's done until these things become the values that shape their conduct. So we have talked about talking today, our seasoned speech, and God is saying, may these things be taught to your children. But before God says, teach them to your children, he begins by saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your heart. In other words, internalize these things first before you teach them. Did you ever hear about uh, Gandhi? Uh, a story that I heard about uh, Mahatma Gandhi, that a mother approached him and said, please, may you help my son? He has a challenge. Um, is um and so the, the 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 son i mean it was a son this boy was putting uh, you know something like so much um you know salt in his food too much salt in his food and he said that uh, gandhi uh, said well i cannot answer for today but after some weeks later on he said that uh, he came back to that woman and said now i can help your son and now I can talk to him about not putting too much salt in his food. And uh, so Gandhi talked to the boy. And then they said, but why did you have to wait? We thought you could have said that the other time. And uh, it is said that Gandhi said, at that time, when you made the request, I was still struggling with, that, with the same problem. So I could not do it then. And so I needed to have my life transformed first so that I speak out of experience. I speak not just out of my mouth, but my whole life and being testifies to my words. So may God help us in our families, as parents, especially as husbands and wives, that uh, our speech may be seasoned and that thus being seasoned, 
to those who still have uh, children who are young in their families, that we may impress these things upon their minds, upon their hearts, not only by telling them, but especially by modeling and exemplifying, demonstrating by how we communicate as adults and how we talk to them as parents. May God help us. May God bless us uh, with these words. God bless you, everybody. Amen. Amen. Amen.